Okay. All right. And we are, we're good to go. Okay. Usually it tells me it's recording, but okay, we're going to roll. So as Hartley said, I'm Tammy Schatzko. I live in Northern Minnesota. So we are using technology today so we can virtually be together. I am a certified professional organizer. I run a company named We Love Messes. I've been doing this for about eight years, but I think I have been organized my entire life. It kind of feels like being in the yang and that I do this because it's a, a gift and a talent I've been given. And lots of times people ask me why I do this. And it took me a long time to figure the answer out to that. But it actually happened in a moment with a client where we were working one-on-one -on -one and she was decluttering and we were talking about why she needed something. And all of a sudden she kind of physically sat up and her, the, her whole body posture shifted. And she's like, oh my gosh, I don't need this and I can let it go. And I understand why I'm decluttering. And it was that light bulb moment for her that made me realize that that is my reward for doing this work. And if it is a talent that I have and a skill that I have and I can share it with other people and let them have those light bulb moments, that makes me really happy. So that is why I'm here. Tonight I'm gonna to talk about uh, organization for parents and families and different ways we can do things and different ways of thinking of things. So I love questions, please feel free to ask me. I like to, Share a disclaimer though at the beginning and that we all think differently. I don't ever go into someone's house and say, you need to do this, this, and this. It's not my home. It's not my way of living. Everybody needs to think about their space the way they think. So if as I'm talking, something doesn't seem right to you or you're like, that doesn't make any sense, then that's not the tip for you. Just ignore it and pick something else out. You can't force something to fit. And I think that's really important for us to know as we're working on organization and systems. So deep breath, let's go. Let's try this exercise. I want everyone to close their eyes just for a moment. And I want you to think about what a perfectly organized home looks like to you, not to anyone else, but just to you. Give me a second. All right, ready? I'm gonna show you a picture of it. Here we go. Here's the picture. There's no image available for a perfectly organized home for you because we all think differently. So what this perfectly organized home looks like to me and to you, that's two separate things because we're all unique. So the other question is about our homes is how many of us live in our space? Is that not why we pay mortgages and rent so that we can live in our space and own it as our own? How many of you have looked at a magazine spread and go, that's what I want for my house? Let me give you a little tip. Those magazine spreads, we call that art because nobody lives in those spaces. There's nothing out of place. You can't live and make memories in a place like that. Are they beautiful? Absolutely. Would I love to observe one from a distance? Yes, but I can't live in that space because I would always be on edge. So don't make that your goal. Make your goal something that works for you. And normal, that's different for each of us. I also like to share this particular picture. So in my mind, in full transparency, this is my, this is my ideal desk. This is what I would like my office to look like. This is what I aim for. Do you want to know what it looks like sometimes? It looks like that. Okay, that's a mess, a really big mess. And it makes me anxious actually every time I use this slide because I remember that it looking like that. But here's the thing. That office looked that way after a really busy week I'd had and everything just kind of got dropped in there but it didn't cause me anxiety to walk in there because I knew that when I had time and I had time in my schedule I would be able to put everything away because I had a system for where everything went and I'm going to share that system with you today and a lot of times I think even as a parent of an adult ch children, I still get overwhelmed by life, by business, by work, by social life, by all the demands in our lives. And I love having systems. They help me from keeping overwhelmed. So I'd like you to think for a moment. Remember I said that each of us is unique and normal means different things to different people. When you look at this particular picture, now these are all three, these are all very, very different rooms that are normal for different people. Mm -hmm. I can tell you which one resonates with me, and I bet when you're looking at it, you can tell which one resonates with you and which one maybe doesn't feel good at all. The reality is, 
it's your reality, not mine. There are no judgments about anything we're going to talk about tonight. It's more of you need to know where you're comfortable and we need to make that a reality. The other part of looking at this is if you know what your reality is, then you probably have a good idea of what your expectation for your child is. But there's a challenge with what our expectation for our children is and how we send them that message and how we lay out what the expectation is. Do they know what the expectation is? Have we told them? Have we related to them? And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like as we move forward. So what is the key to organizing? Well, there's a lot of them. Mostly it's systems. I'm a fan of systems. System, system, systems. And that's just a big fancy word for making it work for you. You have to make fit systems that fit your daily routine and give you easy access to your belongings. So for example, a lot of times when I'm doing paper filing with clients, they will have purchased some kind of filing system at Target or Office Max or they saw something online that just looked really sleek and sexy and shiny and they were all excited and then they get it and it doesn't work for them because it's not set for their the way they think about things. And the analogy I use is how many of us have gone into a clothing store, seen an outfit on a mannequin and go, yeah, I want that. We buy it, we take it home, and it really probably doesn't look the same on us as it did in the mannequin. But if you've ever looked at the back of a mannequin, there's pins and staples and tapes. They have tweaked that outfit to look perfect from the front of the mannequin. Mm -hmm. Our organizing systems are like that too. If we purchase a system, we have permission to tweak it to make it work. Whatever system I talk about with, with you tonight or with anyone else, it needs to work for the way they think, the way you think, or it's gonna break down. If it doesn't fit your daily routine and it doesn't give you easy access to your belonging, it's not gonna work, you're gonna get frustrated, and then it's gonna fall apart, and you're back to square one, and then you're frustrated. So, knowing that, I kind of worked out a generic system that works for everybody because it's the concept. It's not talking about containers and pretty, pretty, and what we call Pinterest porn and all of that. It's the actual system that moves us from cluttered to decluttered, from unorganized to organized. And it will work across the board. Doesn't matter if you're talking about a junk drawer or your master closet or your kid's room. It doesn't matter. The concept is the same. So I would really like to share that with you tonight. And here's just a little piece of humor. I'm a big fan of Zitz. He always seems on target for me. That's the way he organizes. I don't know if any of you can identify with that. But I've seen kids' rooms minus the signs with the sniff test that looks something similar to that. So the STEPS program is basically an analogy for sort, total, eliminate, place, and straighten. And we'll kind of go through those steps one by one. If you're gonna win, not if, because I want you all to try this out. When you try this at home, please start with something small and contained like a kitchen drawer or the bathroom drawer or your underwear drawer or something like that where it's contained. People get all excited, they go home and they rip into their master closet, they take everything out and they start this process. And then they're exhausted and it gets overwhelming and there's too much stuff and too many decisions and it gets, it breaks down. So I always encourage people to start small, get some success and then build on those successes and the decision making process will get so much easier. Don't start with your kids' mementos and your kids' paperwork, bad idea. There's too much emotional weight in those. We need to start think with things like how many toothbrushes do you need? All these cleaning supplies, things like that where we're not emotionally attached to them. So let's talk about the first one, sort. Seems pretty obvious, right? We kind of need to sort like with like. It's pretty much the manual process of putting like with like, kind of like the diagram. It's the essential first step. How many of you guys have ever bought something that you already owned and realized when you got home that you already owned it? happens all the time because we don't keep like with like when we're unorganized. It happens to me too. I can't find something, even though I know where it is, once I've done through this process and there's a step for that too, it becomes easier. And then if you're a fan of Maxine, I like the way she organizes too. She must be a procrastinator, that's all I'm gonna say. 
All right, so once we've sorted everything, so if you can kind of visualize taking a kitchen drawer and sorting spatulas and slotted spoons and the things that you find in a kitchen drawer, the next thing you have to do is total because it's impossible to decide how many things we need or can use if we don't know the total we have. And that means bringing it all together. So if you have multiple kitchen utensils in multiple drawers, it would be sorting them all together and then totaling them up as to what they look like. So once we've sorted in total, those are pretty much the easiest steps because they're, they're pretty self-explanatory. You sort like with like, and then you find out how many you have. And then everybody takes a deep breath and panics with this one because nobody wants to eliminate. It feels uncomfortable, it feels wrong. If I had a dime for every time I have gone into a client's home and the spouse or significant other says, you're gonna make me get rid of all my stuff, aren't you? That's not what I'm here to do. I, I'm, I would never tell someone they had to get rid of something. I might ask them a few questions as to how useful it is for them, but nobody has to get rid of anything. It's scary though to think about letting go of our stuff. We are very attached to our stuff. If we ask ourselves the right questions, this process gets a lot easier. What do we surround ourselves with? What do we want our things to say about us? And the three biggest questions are, what do you need, use, and love? Asking ourselves those questions when we're looking at our piles is very helpful. Some decisions are a lot harder than others. Like I mentioned, starting with kids' paperwork, artwork, you know, mementos from a deceased parent. Those are bad things to start with because they're really, really hard and we get stuck. So we want to start with something easier. Easy decisions when we're eliminating are duplicates, broken items, trash. Those things can go. We know they can go. They're easy. We let them go. We downsize. Something to think about when we total up our things. So I know I'm using the kitchen drawer analogy a lot, but it's an easy one because it's pretty familiar for all of us. So if you're in a kitchen, if I'm working in a kitchen with someone who, you know, is gone all the time, doesn't have kids, doesn't really use the kitchen that much, and they've got like eight spatulas, we're probably going to talk about how many spatulas they can really use at a time. And they might, if we're lucky, get rid of, you know, two thirds of them. If I'm in a kitchen with a foodie, someone who's always in the kitchen, entertaining, loves to cook, passionate about whatever, that eight spatulas is going to mean something completely different to them than the person who doesn't use the kitchen that much. So that's where those questions come into mind as, do I need it? Do I use it? Do I love it? And if you think about it long enough, the answer is always going to be yes. So don't overthink it. Just go, go, go. Have these little bins set up or whatever that looks like and just make your decisions and eliminate. Something to think about. I say, do you need it? Do you use it? Do you love it? So love is a tough one because we all love our stuff. I love chocolate. I love coffee. You know, I love my coffee mugs. I love a lot of things. But I also think love is a verb, and if you actually love something, if we're actually invested in keeping it, then we need to take care of it. So for example, I had this client who, her mom had passed away, I think it was about 20 years ago. And for that 20 years, she had stored her mom's stuff in the garage, in boxes, and could not park in the garage. Now, most of us are from Northern Minnesota. How cold is it here in the winter? It had been a many, many years since she parked in the garage, because of that stuff from her mom. She couldn't bring herself to go through it. And one summer she decided that they were, we were gonna go through it, we did. In that stuff, we found her husband's letterman, letterman's jacket. So it was probably 40 years old. She was so excited when I pulled it out of the box. Now I'm just gonna preface this with, this is not a climate controlled garage. This was a cardboard box. So when I pulled the letterman's jacket out, you know how the sleeves are nice and white because they're leather? This one was black because it was full of mold, because it wasn't stored properly. But she was so excited. She loves this jacket. He loves this jacket. He's going to be so excited. She was just so excited. So part of what I do when I work with clients is I find resources. I went home and I researched what it would look like to restore that letterman's jacket because she was so excited and she loved it. It was costly, really, really costly. And when I came back to her with that information and she showed it to her husband, he's like, 
I don't want that. I can't wear it. It would have to go on a wall somewhere. He's like, why would we keep that? So there you go. She may have loved the memory attached to it, but the jacket itself, it got eliminated. And they were both happy about that. So be gentle with ourselves when we think about what love means, because I think in our culture and our society today, we love a lot of things, but it's not really, we don't really take take care of stuff so much. So once we've made some hard decisions about what we're going to eliminate, we're left with what we are going to keep, which comes up for P for place. You've probably heard the saying, a place for everything and everything in its place. It's pretty much where this goes. We put things in its, in its home because if we don't have a home for it, we might want to think about why we have it in the first place. We've sorted. We've totaled up what we need. We've eliminated what we no longer need, and now we're left with what's truly useful and important to us and our home and our space. To organize those items, we need to put them in the home that they belong in, and that's going to look different for each item. So again, back to the kitchen. If you're a foodie and you like to have utensils available to you, probably the utensils home or place is not going to be in the kitchen drawer, but it might be on the stove in a utensil caddy. If you're not a foodie, you don't use your kitchen that much and you like the counters clear, the place for your utensils is probably going to be a kitchen drawer. Again, it's thinking about how we use our space and how that's different for every single person who lives in different homes. So how I use my space and how you would use my space, those are different things. So you need to ask ourselves those questions. So another example for place would be thinking about things that are at our fingertips are kind of valuable resources. So most of us carry a purse. Some of us carry a tote that passes for a purse but has lots of stuff in it. If you're a frequent cell phone user, think about where your cell phone goes. Do you drop it in the tote and you're always digging around in there trying to find it when it's ringing and nobody can ever get a hold of you because you can never get to the call or the text? If you are a frequent cell phone user, think about where you place that phone. Could you have a clip on the outside of your tote for the phone so that you have easy access to it? It's a valuable real estate, you want to keep in contact with it. If you're not using it that much, it can drop in the tote and you never give it a second thought. If you're thinking about organizing your kitchen and you have kids and they want an art center, you want to keep them close to you. Place your art center somewhere in the kitchen where you can keep an eye on the kids, but it's not going to be in the immediate space you need to cook dinner if you have that luxury. Things that we don't use that often, we want to keep off-site and away. For example, when I first moved into my house, probably eight years ago, I had a left the griddle. And you know, those things are like huge. And when we moved in, the boxes got unpacked and it got put into a corner cupboard that I had to crawl over every time I wanted to get a baking pan. It took me like five years to have this light bulb moment that the left the griddle that I used once a year did not need to be stored in the kitchen and take up that valuable real estate. It went down to the storage room I knew exactly where it was when I needed to go get it, and it cleared up so much space in the kitchen, it was ridiculous. But it's rethinking about where we place our items and what that looks like for each of us. So far, so good. How are we doing for questions? Good? Okay. So we started, we totaled, we eliminated, and we placed things in our home. Seems pretty easy, right? Like I said, you can go from a junk drawer, to a master closet, to a garage, to an attic. Here's the thing that keeps the system functioning. Remember when I talked about how messy my office was and how it didn't give me a lot of anxiety because I knew that I had a system in place for getting it straightened up? That's the S, straighten. Straighten is not cleaning though. It's not the same thing. It's not whipping out the Tide, or not the Tide, sorry. Not whipping out the Windex and the furniture polish and doing that kind of stuff. Straightening is actually the ticket to maintaining your space. If everything has a place, okay, if you've eliminated everything you don't need, everything you do need has a place, then straightening should be relatively easy. And it takes a few incarnations to get to the step where it feels good. And we have to redo the sort, the total, the eliminate, and the place a lot before we get to a place where this is easily maintained. Straighten is as simple as putting everything in its home. That seems a little overwhelming, so I recommend for my clients that they do it more than once a month or even once a year. I'm thinking like every night, depending on the space. Again, 
all the stuff on the left hand side of that picture I'm assuming that's left all the stuff that's junky on the one side that all has a home like there's garbage and laundry hanging there that has places it can go once it's taken out and put away it becomes a nice neat workspace again it's something that we can do we can teach our kids to do it by modeling it for them it's really not hard it seems overwhelming because we get bucketed down in that eliminate step but i promise you once you work through that do i need it do i use it do i love it process a couple of times it starts to become second nature and we can move on so we got it we have steps we know what to do what do we do about the kids because I hear it a lot. I have a mom have me come in and she's like, I just can't keep these kids organized. And I get it, but generally those moms that are asking me for help, they're not so organized themselves and the kids are picking that up from them. Not a judgment, it's just we perpetuate it in our kids. So, here's one way we can have the kids help. What I'm suggesting is that we let them help us. And by doing that, we're communicating expectations to them, but we're also, also needing to really, really lower the standards of what we're expecting to get done when our kids are helping. It's hard. It's hard. I know it's been a few years since I've had kids, little kids, but man, they're messy. They just, they're messy, and they don't do things the way we would do them because we like things neat and want to put away. If we let them help us, as messy as it is, it gives them confidence, and sooner or later, they're gonna figure out that they can do it themselves, and they're gonna start doing it themselves, and those steps are gonna get a whole lot easier. These are some excellent books for teaching kids how to organize, because we have to manage our expectations. We have to teach them how to do it. To tell them to go, or to go clean up their room, they don't understand. They don't understand what that means. So the top two books, Benji's and Susie's Messy Room, were actually written by a, a professional organizer. And then, I mean, who doesn't like Berenstain Bears? It's just a given. So clearly it's a problem in our society if they're writing Berenstain books about it, right? Uh, let's see. So what I find out of these books, too, is when we talked about that slide early on with the three different bedrooms kind of on a, on a range of what was messy, and I asked you about expectations and what your expectations are and what the, do your children know that that's your expectation. These are excellent resources for helping us have that conversation of, these are the things I'm thinking, of course as a parent, you're not gonna say that to the kid, but showing the children via visual images what the expectation is and giving them the tools so they can go do it themselves. You have no idea how many college dorms and college apartments I'm in and young adults where it's just like, I don't know how these people are functioning in the adult world because the behind the scenes is a disaster. I don't know how they find anything. I don't know how they make decisions. It, it literally scares me to think about what's coming up in the future. So if we can start here and start small while they're little, we have lots of, of um, hope. That's good. Okay. Biggest question I ever get when I'm doing any type of organizing, parent or otherwise, is what in the world do we do with all of our children's papers and artwork. What? Tell me. It's a flood. It's a tidal wave. We can't deal with it. There's too much. I get it. So again, if we apply, this, apply the steps that we talked about, and I know that this is simplistic, so it's up to you guys to figure out what this looks like in your own space and to set up receptacles or whatever and make that happen. And I'm going to give you some examples, but get creative. It does not have to look like a Pinterest picture. Okay, I love Pinterest. I'm guessing, I can't see hands, but I'm guessing if I asked everybody to raise hands, everybody raise their hands. I'm just gonna do my PSA about Pinterest. We get stuck there because we expect it to look like what's on Pinterest. And honest to God, most of us don't have enough time to do that. So don't expect your system to look like Pinterest. Make it work for you. Just make it work because it will make your life better so that maybe you do have time to do Pinterest projects later. Okay. Children's papers and artwork, the step, the step program. So if you think about them coming home from school or wherever, sort the papers upon arrival. Like, don't wait, don't shove them somewhere. Do it like right there, right then. I'm a really big fan of paying, 
paying time up front for saving time down the road. And I guarantee, I know it's the last thing you want to do and it's the last thing you want to hear, but I'm telling you, this is the way to manage the STEM, I'm sorry, the tidal wave of um, papers coming in. So even with my adult clients who are complaining about the mail coming in, for example, I tell them not to get their mail from the mailbox until they're ready to sort it. And I tell them to have a receptacle right right at their front door so that they can literally pitch whatever is not necessary. Same thing here. The minute you touch the paperwork or the artwork, sort it. Total what needs to say, how many papers of each do you need? If they brought home eight math, math papers from that week, can you eliminate some of them? I don't know, that's gonna be different for each one of you and what you wanna keep moving forward. And it, it does shift over the preschool years, and kindergarten and they start you know bringing home tons of paper and they get less and less important for most people so really think about what that looks like and realize that the precedence that you set today you're gonna feel you're gonna want to maintain it so if you keep every single paper they bring home in preschool and kindergarten you're gonna want to maintain that through the rest of the years and with younger children it's really hard so think about what needs to say and eliminating what isn't needed place the papers or projects in their I can't see the bottom of the screen, in their spot, in their home. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that could look like. And again, we can get creative with this. And then straighten up. It doesn't have to be once a week. I just pick that number arbitrarily. It's whatever works for you. You choose the time frame, but try to make a conscious effort if you're going to work with this system to schedule time in either subconsciously or in your calendar to do the straightening up. Because I promise you, that's the tipping point. You don't have time to straighten. You don't make the time to straighten. The whole system will kind of, kind of shred down, and you'll have to start all over again. It's not impossible, and we can do it as many times as we need to. But to maintain, we have to make the best of interest into straightening up. So if everything has a home, you can ask yourself: If this doesn't home have a home, do I really need it, or why do I have it? I'm. Sorry, this might have gone in the wrong order. Okay, so again, if we're wanting our kids to succeed and we want to demonstrate to them how things work, we want to set the rule and set the, set the routines for them right away. So again, we live in northern Minnesota. For the love of God, we can have four seasons within a week. It's, it's totally possible. We need bigger entry areas. Most of us don't have that. Get creative, use the vertical space on your wall, whatever that looks like, put hooks up. Whatever you can do to get stuff up off the floor is gonna make it easier for all of us to maintain and straighten. So here's some solutions for the backpack, either right inside the front door, on their door, you know what works really good is the wreath hooks at Christmas time, if you put one of those on the door with a chain down so that the kids can reach it, they just, their backpacks go right there. Give them a place to put the backpack besides the floor then they know where it goes, then you know where it is, then they know where to go to get stuff, and you know where to go to put stuff. It seems really elementary and silly. I'm telling you it's life-changing, I promise you. So I want you to all go home and try it and let me know what that looks like. So everything has a home or a place. You have a place for everything and everything in its place. Another tip, and again, I understand that it seems counterproductive to take the time to put things away when you're in the heat of the moment and you're rushing to get dinner on the table, you're rushing to get out the front door, but I promise you, 30 seconds it's gonna take you to do what, put it away is gonna save you 10 minutes down the road when you're looking for it and you can't find it because you can't remember where you set it down. I promise. Don't put it down, put it away. Give it to your kid and if everything has a place or a home, you can tell them exactly where to put it. Hey. Here's mom's keys, go put them in my purse. Hey, here's a dirty dish, go put it in the sink or the dishwasher. If things have places, we can tell our kids where to put them. And then it saves us having to do it. If you have a closet, use it. If not, use the vertical space again on the walls. We, we don't think about that enough, is using up and down versus benches and things like that. Does anybody know what the definition of clutter is in the professional organizing world? No hands, of course, I can't. I can't see anyone. <laughs> okay, it's delayed decisions. Literally, that's what it boils down to is those two words. I can't tell you how many times a client has picked an item up, they're telling me the story behind it if they need to process through it, and they'll say, but I don't really want it, I've been meaning to get rid of it for a while. 
that's just clutter because it's a delayed decision. They already knew what they wanted to do with it. They just didn't do it. So don't put it down, put it away, and it eliminates clutter. Okay, but what do we do with the artwork? So I'm going back to artwork, if that's accumulating, because I get that a lot too. Have some different ideas for it, some really creative stuff. A lot of my parents use a lim what we call a limiting bin, which essentially is one bin per child per year. And it doesn't even have to be one bin. I'll show you another idea later. They will, um, a lot of clients use the, uh, the roller, like the sweater storage, I think they're called bins that roll underneath the bed. And they will keep one in each kid's room. And it's up to the child to decide what gets saved and what goes away. So once the bin is full, like if the first two months of school, they save everything in that bin. And then it comes to the middle of January and the bin is full and it's overflowing. They have to go through and make decisions about what stays and what goes. And I'm telling you, this is a great process to watch. You will learn so much about your child during this. And you will learn about the artwork, too. There's been a lot of times where I've watched this process, and the parent has one vision of what that piece of artwork meant, and the kid's got a completely different story behind it. So you want to save the stuff that's important to the kid. Not that you can't take the memories that are important to you, too, but it's much more impactful for the child if they're making the decisions. Not only that, but if they're making decisions about little things like this, because these are important decisions to them at this point in their life, their decision-making skills are gonna grow and grow and grow, and they're gonna launch into adulthood with the ability to make decisions about much bigger things, all because they've had to decide what can live in their space and what can't. Because contrary to our society's belief, we do not have unlimited space. We do not have unlimited resources. I know we can store things in the cloud until forever, but even at that, at some point, I assume is going to fill up. So we need to teach our kids that our physical space is limited. Even though we can buy storage units, we can buy bigger homes, it's not the answer. It's making our stuff fit in the space we have. So the limiting bin works really good, not only to contain things, but to help the kids make decisions. We can take pictures of the kid with the artwork and save the picture, not the art. This works really well for big, bulky things. Label, label, label everything. I can't tell you how many art bins I've gone through with kids where the parents can't remember if that was Johnny's third grade paper or Susie's second grade paper because they all look kind of similar and we think we're going to remember, but really we're busy and we don't. It's too much to remember. Label everything that goes in the bin because you won't remember later. And again, toss teaching the value of honoring, you know, just because we let go of something doesn't necessarily mean that we're letting go of the memory. And this applies for adults and for children, which is why taking a picture of the child with the artwork works really well if they're invested in the artwork. Holding on to things just because so-and-so gave it to us and that memory is attached to that doesn't necessarily help us in our space. And what if we don't wanna do any of those things? We have some creative use for artworks too. This is one of my favorite, is the clothesline for the artwork. And that could be strong anywhere. I've seen it in entryways, I've seen it in kitchens, I've seen it in living rooms. It's really fun. Not only for the kids to see their artwork in display, but it sparks conversation. People who are coming into the home to visit or you know, hang out with the kids. It's just a great conversation starter and it makes them feel really special. And you can rotate things out. You know, they, they again, can decide what goes up, what comes down. Clearly, it's not lim unlimited space. So if you've got room for four pictures and they've already got four pictures up there, they need to make the decision about what comes down. Greeting cards are another way. You know, if you're sending birthday, whatever, to grandparents using their artwork to make greeting cards, there is a company online, and I'm sorry I don't have the name of it on the slide, that will turn the artwork into a postage stamp. There's also companies that will turn them into calendars, or you can do it yourself. Placemats are really fun, I think. Frame it. I'm sure you've all seen the frames that have that open up, and you can put the artwork of the week in there and then shut the door, and you can swap it in and out quite easily. And wrapping paper. That's always my favorite, because what grandparent or special person doesn't want to get a gift wrapped in something that a kid has created? I just think that's really fun. There's also ways to, or, and companies that work with bulky stuff and quantity of stuff. So there's a company called Plum Print, and they're online. And you can do any of these things, books, calendars, pillows. They do tons of stuff. But what's really cool is that they literally, you can put everything in a box. And I'm talking 
uh, plaster molds of hands. I'm trying to think of what else kids create, you know, 3D stuff that's heavy and bulky and, and put it in a box, send it to them. They will put it in a, in a book format and then put it online so that you can go through the book and make decisions and, and um, I'm trying to say, you can put titles on it and descriptions and things like that. And then they'll print the book and send it to you. And then there's the really hard decision of whether you have them send the artwork back, back to you and store it or whether you let them discard it. So I've had clients struggle through both, kind of up to them. There's also um, a new company. This is out of Bemidji, Minnesota. She calls it, she's called it the Dandelion Vault. And she also preserves special memories by doing the same, by digitizing them. And it's really cool. And you can find both these companies online. They both have websites and you can check out more about them. I think it's a fun way to preserve art, preserve hey, memories. Yeah. I have a request. If we could go back to the, uh, to the slide before Plum Print. That yes. One. Yep, the using artwork. Yes. Just think about any, just think that that artwork is just like paper. So anything you would do with construction paper, you can do with their artwork, but it's even more impactful because it's something that they've created. As long as you explain it to the kids that that's what you're doing is creating something else out of their stuff versus them coming in and finding us cut up, cutting up their artwork. But does that answer the question? We're good, thank you. Yeah. We're good, okay. So again, there's Plum Print, you can find that online. And Dandelion Vault, you can find them online too. And then I talked a little bit about the limiting bins. So you'll probably all laugh, but these were my limiting bins. These were what I set up for my kids when, when they were going through school. They're both graduated now, but this is my daughter, Claire's, and you can see that in each, each uh, year of school had a hanging folder. So she had a bin that she would put her stuff in every day, you know, after school, and we'd go through it and make decisions and eliminate and all of that good stuff. And then at the end of the year, I would take the most important things and put them in a hanging folder. This doesn't seem like very much stuff when it comes to 12 years of school, but I'm telling you all the important stuff was in there. This was my method. Again, I'm not telling you everything everybody that this is the only way to do it. This is what worked for me. There's many other ways. You can have bigger totes. You can have one tote per year, whatever floats your boat. Uh, what I will say is having gone through two high school graduations, having access to these little bins of stuff made life so much easier because we were able to utilize her artwork in different places and had a really fun time going through it with her looking for stuff. So I know that probably seems a long ways off for some of you as high school graduation, but I'm telling you, again, putting the time in now is going to save you so much headache when you're already stressed out about way other things like college and graduation and them leaving the nest and everything's very emotional. This is the ticket. Do it now. Do it bit by bit, and you're going to be 10 steps ahead when you get to that point. Okay. That's a lot of information. How are we doing? Good. Okay. So I thought I would little talk a little bit about navigating crunch time. So crunch time looks a little bit different for everyone, but the key again is systems. So crunch time for some people is mornings and getting out the door, getting up on time, getting kids ready, getting everybody out the door to wherever they need to be. For some people, it's the after school, the sports, the activities, getting everybody different places. For some people it's dinner time. What am I going to get on the table? Who's going to eat what? Who's going to be home to eat what? Homework time is another one, and bedtime. So for all of those, no matter which it is, again, across the board, the answer is a routine. And again, in this, we're talking about defining what our expectations are for, our, for ourselves. What is my expectation of what it looks like when the kids come home from school? And it, I'm not trying to be militant. Nobody, nobody has to do bullet point. This is what I expect from you as a child. It's more knowing in my mind how I want it to flow and then talking my kid through it by example so that we can work on it together. It's never going to be perfect, but kids, they respond to routines. They respond to knowing what they need to do. It's hard. They buck it, but in the end, they feel better. I always, in my mind, put it together with swaddling an infant, which seems really weird, but if you think about it, fussy babies, if you swaddle them, they stop crying toddlers, preschoolers, even adolescents, if you give them their expectations, you give them a routine to follow, they may buck you, but they're going to feel better inside and they're going to be able to follow it out. You're giving them life skills. 
So again, it's not fun or exciting or anything like that, but it works. Here's a routine that I've used for clients for after school. Again, having a place for the backpack, backpack to be hung up, having a garbage can right there, not under the sink, not 10 steps away, literally right where the backpacks go. And that way they can empty out food wrappers. You all know what we find in backpacks. So right away, the garbage gets right there. It doesn't get strewn across the house. They don't say that they forgot because the can is right there. You're making it easy for them and easy for us. Immediately eliminate unnecessary. So that means putting whatever we can on a calendar. We're going to talk about calendars in a little bit. A place for the papers that need parental review or signatures. Again, these are habits that worked for me. I'm not suggesting that everybody has to do it this way, but I would review them every evening. I recommend for most parents that they try to do that because things, it's that straightening thing. Things catch up with us. We're busy. The five minutes we might need to spend reviewing now might save us a half an hour at the end of the week of angst when we realize we forgot something and now we're backtracking to find it, all of that kind of stuff. I love the idea of having a folder for reference info. And even though most of our stuff is going digital from the school, we still are getting a lot of papers and it's handy to have this. Even if it saves you 10 minutes during a school year, you'll always know where that information is. You can always send someone else to find that information if you're not in the house. And then again, having that limiting container and that can look different for everyone. It could be a bin in the kitchen. It could be something underneath the kid's bed. Whatever, they need to know where that limiting container is, how to find it, and what to put in there. Oh, uh, let's see. So that's the after-school example. Mornings and dinner time, you've probably all heard this a million times, but prepping the night before. And again, I know it takes time. I, I feel you, I understand, but I guarantee that spending a few minutes the night before, even when you're exhausted, is going to set you up for success the next day. It just gets you out the door better. You feel prepared. You're ready to face whatever the day has to offer. One tip I have for homework time is something that I use a lot actually for myself. I'm a very visual person. This is called the time timer. Again, it's not fancy. It's very low technology, which is why I like it. But but you can set it for 55 minutes or an hour, and then literally the kids can see the time disappearing. It really helps uh, visualize how much time is left. If they're antsy, how much more time do I have to sit here? It's so much easier to say, you've got 15 minutes, and they can see the red, than to say, you've got 15 minutes, and let them figure out what that looks like. So again, it's setting the expectation using whatever tools you have, whether it's a visual or words or whatever that looks like. And the kids need us to set that example. They turn to us for modeling and how to do it, and they absorb what's happening around them, whether we want them to or not. So I hear from parents a lot. When I start talking about chores and helping around the house, they'll say, well, my, my, kids, my kids are too young to do that. And oh, I'm sorry, I was going to share this humor for you because I think it's funny. Again, I like zits. So I found this graphic the other day and it really your kids might not be to the smartphone level but I was in the grocery store the other day and I saw a kid using a tablet that was probably five and he was operating it on a higher level than I can function with so this seems fairly accurate the kids are really smart they're really capable of doing these things so here's the biggest challenge I have when I'm talking to my parental clients about letting the kids participate, not letting, getting the kids to participate at home. The kids don't do it to their expectation. And I understand that, believe me, I, I have my fair share of OCD when it comes to cleaning and the way things should be done and everything needs to be neat. I get that. If we don't let them do it now, if we don't let them do it imperfectly, they're gonna give up trying and then we're gonna be really stuck when they become teens and they're not participating because we set the expectations so high. It's hard to let go, but I guarantee they might do it messy, but they can do all of these things at different ages. And it's good for them to learn how to do it. Hey, Tammy. Yeah. Can we go see, can we see the Zitz cartoon again? Yes. <laughs> I never know how fast to go with that. I think that is hilarious. <laughs> Just let me know when to go. 
serious. I used to read zits every day and I swear it's like they read my mind every day it hit whatever I was dealing with. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. So if your kids can operate a tablet, give them a broom, whatever, it's good for them. Trust me. Like I said, I'm in enough young adult housing to know that these kids are not learning how to do this. They just, you would think it's fairly self-explanatory, but it, it's not. Okay. So when I'm talking about setting expectations for our kids, this is a huge one. Sending our kids into their rooms to clean it. There's no concept for them. Just like when you tell them that you've got 15 minutes to sit here, they visually can't figure out what 15 minutes looks like. But if you have a time timer or some kind of visual representation, it's so much easier for them. And it's so much more less frustrating. This was a great graphic I thought I found for cleaning their room. It pretty much explains what needs to be done to be considered clean. And again, that's different for each one of us. Maybe you don't care if the shoes are put away. That's fine. And again, those the Benji and the Susie's messy room and the Berenstein Bear kind of go through this process too. Because organizing is a process. That straightening piece, that's essentially what you're teaching them here with this graphic or whatever graphic you want to use. It's really overwhelming for little people to walk into their bedroom where everything's a mess. I mean, how many of you guys have Legos? Oh my stars, those things just give me nightmares. There's like five million little pieces to each set. Think about as an adult going in and having to straighten all that. The kids, their concept, they're not there yet cognitively. So if we can help them visually by explaining what does it mean to clean your room, they're gonna be much more equipped to do it. I have adults that go into a room and can't straighten it. Clearly, I have a job because that exists. So I'm trying to work myself out of a job by getting the kids on board so that they can figure out what it looks like as young adults. Plus, they're going to be running the world at some point, so we want to train them now. Yes, ma'am? Is um, I've got a question if that is if that graphic is available on your website or where somebody... This one is not available on the website, but seriously, I think I typed in clip art for... You know what, if, if that person, whoever it is, hello, if they want to either send me an email or drop in the comments their email address, I will happily send it to them. I have it on my computer right now, and that'll save you having to search for it. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, another question I get a lot is, how are we going to stay connected? And this changes as the kids grow. I have four tips for you. Um, Holding family, weekly family meetings, not as important when they're little. I mean, that might be more for you and your partner, or you and your spouse, or, you know, your family unit. But the kids, again, it's that modeling, and it feels counterproductive to include them at the younger age, but it's super important. These weekly family meetings are an opportunity to talk about what's coming up in the week, who needs to be picked up where, what the scheduling looks like. It's not a time to become connected. It's not a time to try to talk to them, because... If we set it up as, oh, we're going to discuss why you got a D on your paper at the family weekly family meeting, they're not going to want to come. We want to make it about what does the schedule for the week look like? How can we stay connected? Who needs what? When do they need it? Where do they need to be? That kind of stuff. And again, the changes, you know, from babies on up. We want to keep it light. Signing up for a shared email address, I love this idea. Did you guys know that 269 billion emails are sent globally every year. That's a lot of emails, and I swear most of them comes from the kids' school. So if you sign up for a shared email address, you and whomever else is on that account is going to get the same emails from the school, which means you don't have to be responsible for getting the information out because it's going to be shared. So if you get an email that Johnny's soccer practice got moved from field A to field C, instead of you having to text whoever is driving Johnny to field A and field C, they're going to know because they're going to get the same email. So it's one way to reduce the amount of communication that has to happen between busy parents and busy family units. I think it's a great idea. And then as the kids grow and get older and more mature, they can be looped into the shared email address so that they're finding out what's happening too. And then everybody's kind of on the same page. And nobody can say, I didn't know about that because that happens too. So another way to stay connected is two ways. I like a hybrid approach for calendars. I have a digital calendar and a paper calendar because I like to write. So there's a couple shared calendar apps. Cozy is for Androids only, I think. I really like it. It's like a family management 
program and everybody can be on it as the kids get older they can be on it too but it helps keep track of what's happening where people are at grocery list it, it has quite a wealth of stuff you can use or you can just use the basic stuff to communicate with each other if you're an apple user the apple calendar works really well i'm a fan of having large paper calendars and shared spaces i actually use whiteboards with and the kids can color on them but i keep them in a shared space so that everybody sees them I think that's important. And if you put the kids as part of maintaining them, again, I know the kids are little yet, but as they grow older, it's just going to become natural for them to be planners because they're going to realize that this stuff has to happen. Okay, how are we doing? Good? All right. A lot of the last area I wanted to cover is gift giving and receiving. I get a ton of questions about birthday parties and what does that look like? And my kid gets so much stuff and I just don't need all that junk, that kind of thing. So it goes both ways. Gift giving and gift receiving does create more stuff in our homes. I'm not saying that that's not all valuable stuff or that we don't want it, but sometimes it just feels a little overwhelming. Do you know what the single most valuable gift you can give someone is? or that you can receive. It's your time. Because that's a piece you're never gonna get back. However, giving time is a tough concept in our society. And it is received differently by different people. So you, you wanna be aware of it. I happen to like, clearly I like these ideas or I wouldn't be telling you about them. But here are some ideas for gifts for the future. So when my kids were babies, we did the savings bonds and the 529 college funds, and there's two different types now of the 529s. You know, when those kids are little, when they're babies, society makes a big deal out of birthday parties and giving them gifts, but, but what one-year-old even knows what's happening? The thing I have found out about these is that the savings bonds were given when the kids were babies up to probably preschool. They thanked their gift givers twice over because when they went to cash out the savings bonds, it brought that person back into their life because they were the reason that they had money to do whatever it is they were going to use the savings bonds for. If you've ever seen a kid enjoy the box that the toy came in more than the toy itself, these are another reasons to be thinking about these kind of things. The appreciation for the gifts spans the decades. These are particularly good for parent or for grandparents and, and people who don't maybe know the child as well, but is wanting to invest in their future. So some ideas. This is another one of my favorite ones. And again, it's about giving time, sharing experiences with them. This takes a paradigm shift in our minds about what does it look like to go to a birthday party and give a coupon or whatever you want that to look like to go to the Humane Society with a kid because they love animals or visit the library because they love to read or they really like to bake cookies but their mom's not the cookie baking type but you're like the hostess with the mostess and you love that? Totally. What kid wouldn't light up by spending an afternoon baking cookies and frosting them? And they're going to remember that far longer than any gift that we can give them that they're going to outgrow. So, different things. I would love to hear if you guys drop in the comments or whatever ideas that you have for sharing experiences with people or what other, if you've done anything like this, I think it's an up and coming thing for people to be doing because we're getting too much stuff in our lives, but I think it's kind of fun. The, the last thing I have is of course cash. Cash is always king. So when my son was, well, he was older than, than pre, he was probably preteen, but he, uh, you know, we just got to a point where there was really nothing we could give them that they wanted that they didn't already go out and buy themselves because they both had jobs. So one Christmas we decided we were just gonna give them cash, but it felt so uncomfortable to just say, oh, here's a hundred dollars, go have fun. Just, because I like to give gifts. I love to give meaningful gifts. And he's kind of a prankster. So we, um, I turned the hundred dollar bill into that ring that you see on the left there. Aren't I talented? Yeah, that took me like a long time to do. Found this box and then at Christmas time, <laughs> I still feel kind of bad about this. I gave him this big spiel about how he was growing up and it was you know, part of our family history to hand down this, I, mean, I think I said a watch from his grandpa. And if you could have seen the look on his face, it was like dread. He literally was so disappointed because he thought he was getting some kind of historical thing that he had no desire for. And then he opened this and got $100 and he was just ecstatic. So again, you can have fun with it. Cash is fine. 
it, they can go out and purchase what they want. Then. It just feels a little awkward sometimes to give it. So we covered a lot of stuff. We covered steps. We covered staying connected. We covered what to do with kids' artwork. We talked about gift giving, lots of different stuff. If you take one thing out of tonight, I really hope it's the core idea of the steps, which is sort, total, eliminate, place, and straighten. Really, those five steps will get you through any situation with a little work. And it will teach our kids great things too. And to start small. The other thing that I can give you that's really super simple that you can literally go home and do right now is this. In my opinion, in my professional opinion, a donation box is the best idea for a house ever. What the concept is, is having a box or a bag in a couple different places in the house that whomever can drop things in when they know they're done with them. My particular favorite is to have this in the laundry room. You know, when you've worn something that was okay, but it didn't light you up, and instead of sticking it back in your closet, wash it, drop it in the donation box, and when the donation box is full, get it out of the house. We spend so much time bringing things into the house. We rarely take things out other than garbage and recycling, and that's why we, our houses end up so cluttered. Having a donation box allows everybody to make decisions every day of the tiniest things. So maybe your kid has a book that they're like, you know, I don't really like this book, or I don't love it, or I already read it, I don't want it anymore. This gives them somewhere to put it. It gets rid of the delayed decision. They already know they don't want it. Give them somewhere to put it so that it can get out of your house. Or your closet, laundry room, wherever you have room, and then tell everybody in the family about it. That, and if you're stuck, you can call me. You can email me. But I have these awesome, let me grab one. Okay, I don't know how well you can see this. I should have done this as a slide. But this is a clutter flow chart. How does that look, Hartley? Is it backwards? Okay, doesn't matter. Basically, <laughs> what it is, is this happens to be the kids' paper clutter flow chart. So it's literally a flow chart of how to make decisions about what you're stuck on. So you start with your kids' paper here. It asks you questions. If you answer yes, you go one way. If you answer no, you go out their way. It gives you options on what to do with it, and it just walks you through. I have clients that I've given the original one to and they laminate it and put it on their fridge. And I have other clients that use it once or twice or three times They're like, yep, we got this, we're good. And they use that process over and over again. So if that is something you feel like would be useful for you, please email me or drop your email in the comment box and I will send you a PDF. I have a paper clutter, a kid's paper, a keepsake, a holiday, and a getting back on track one for you. So let me know if that's of any help. The quick pick is literally setting that visual timer for five minutes and just hitting a space. Doesn't matter what space, I suggest whichever one is driving you crazy, but a lot of times just forcing yourself to do it, it's like exercising. You just force yourself to do it and then you feel better afterwards. And a lot of times that's enough incentive to just keep you going. And the clutter buddy, I really like this. It's an accountability piece in that perhaps you have a friend or someone else who's experienced similar Frustration over clutter. Teaming up with someone and having each other hold them accountable to getting stuff done is very helpful. The caveat with the clutter buddy is please do not pick a family member because a lot of times there's judgment that comes from families and it becomes a problem. So just be careful who you pick because, because I want to see you succeed more than anything. Um, and of course, if you need anything more, uh, we have a Facebook page with a lot of tips on it. We have a website with a blog on that. And please contact us. We are here to help you. And again, as I said at the beginning, nothing makes me happier than to see that aha moment for the client and see them light up and get that they can make decisions and they can declutter and they can organize their own space for the way that it fits their minds. So thank you. And I hope you have a ton of questions. Hartley, I can't hear you anymore. I'm no? unmuting everybody. So, um, because there's, all, there's, there's, well, supposedly I'm unmuting everybody. <laughs> oh no, they've. I guess they've. They must have left, right? Because we only have their. No, nope, they're still there. Um, uh, no, unmute all. Let's see if that works. I think they've muted themselves. Mm -hmm. 
So if you could tell people if they want to unmute themselves. If you guys want to unmute yourself and ask questions, you certainly can. I'm pretty sure there's a comments box that you can type questions in too, and then Hartley can relay them to me because I can't see them. Um, and there's chat, and there's, we can- Oh, chat, that's what I meant, the chat yeah. box. The um, chat. Oh, okay. They're saying I don't have a question, so I'm there. They don't. Oh, I want questions. <laughs> I must have done a really good job then if nobody had questions. Was there any area that I didn't cover that you guys had that you would want information about? I certainly can delve into something too if, if anyone has a okay. comment or if you have suggestions to say. But I've got one. I, I feel like I, all these steps, the steps process is not something new to me. Okay. How, <laughs> to do that with within my lifestyle is okay. my struggle. <laughs> okay. the, the, she says that the steps process is is not new. Right. It's, I heard that. it's um the, it's the making of the time to follow through with the steps. Yes. Okay, so clearly from a certified professional organizer background, when clients call me and I hate to say this, it's because they want the easy button. It's because they think that I can come in there and go, boop, I'm gonna hit the easy button, this is all gonna disappear. Just like if we're exercising or we wanna lose weight or we have a fitness goal, we have to make time to do it. There is no easy button that gets us away from taking the time and investing the time in it. I don't know what your lifestyle is. My suggestion is choosing, if you could carve out five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, and just work away, check it off on a calendar, make some kind of investment, consider it an investment in yourself, because if you pick away at a place that's a space that's bothering you, it is gonna subconsciously lift your mood every time you walk by that space. I guarantee it, you may not even realize how much it's bothering you until you tackle it. Uh -huh. <laughs> she says she knows how much it's bothering her. Okay, so, so what do you think the biggest roadblock is for you to actually tackle that space? Like you had to pick. Five, five kids and Five no kids. Time. Five kids and no time. And no time. Okay, well we can't make the kids magically disappear because that would be a problem. So is there a space anywhere in the day where you could car or about five minutes to work on it. Okay, she says she's she's already doing more than five minutes a day, but it's not it's not enough to stay ahead of it. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the challenge sometimes is until we get that system kind of in place, which it's an investment. I, I wish I could say that it was easy and that it didn't take that much time, but but it didn't happen that way overnight. I mean this the spaces that I'm in usually didn't happen in the last 10 minutes, but clearly clients generally expect me to be able to fix it in 10 minutes, which if we think about it, it takes so long for a space to get the way it is that sometimes we have to make the investment of the time, whether it's a half a day with no kids or a couple hours incorporating a couple of the kids. We, we have to think creatively and how can we make this work? How can we invest the time in this? to make it work so that I can feel better about that space. And by I, I mean you. But, I mean, could you talk a little bit more about the a clutter buddy? Cause I'm wondering if, if yeah. maybe this is a place that, that a clutter buddy could come in, help you get ahead of it. If that's what, if I'm understanding what a clutter buddy is for. The clutter buddy is, a, is an informal arrangement that you would make with whomever in terms of, oh yeah, I have a space I want to work on too. If we both work on the spaces and report back to each other, then we hold each other accountable. So if I don't feel like doing it today, I'm going to do it anyway because you're doing it and then I'll feel stupid if I didn't do it. Kind of that kind of accountability piece. And I can be honest that when I work with clients, 75% of what I bring to the table is the accountability of knowing that they have to set aside the time because they set up a session with me and I'm going to be there. So they better be. And it feels really... I. I have clients all the time that say, you know, I could do this by myself. And it's like, yes, you could, but you haven't. And that's why I'm here so that we can do it together. And it's done in half the time. So if you can find someone like that, that can, you know, you two can work on the space together and get twice as much done in half the time and then pay it back in her space or his space. That's a great alternative too. But it is, if I had a time machine, there, there's just no way around the time. It's like people have to literally dig into it 
and make a change. Yeah. Not the shiny solution, I'm sorry. That's great. Oh, I've got a question. So I don't know how to point out this, but like our kitchen table is always just a complete disaster because we, oh yeah, yeah, the counter. I mean, the whole kitchen is a mess because we are in the kitchen so much. Um, okay. But yeah, and, and there's like a buffet and the table, and that's where, you know, what do you what do you do with paper? Probably paper is the biggest problem because it's like I mostly read the newspaper when it right when it comes. My husband doesn't read it mm -hmm. until the next weekend when the next newspaper has already come. You okay. know, then that's when he finally gets around to reading the one from the week before. So like there ends up being a stack of newspapers on our table. You know, he, he just doesn't get to them as fast as I do. So but there's always a stack of newspapers, you know, mag not not as much magazines, but like mail that like we should do something about this but we haven't decided what okay. to do about mail and stuff that that's all on our table so it sounds like there's there's a there's a common space a uh -huh. kitchen table an island of top of a buffet where where paper mostly comes in there's two people that need to look at this stuff but they go through it at in different time. Rate, okay. rates and so it ends piling you know but I can't I'm done with this but I can't get rid of it because yeah. my husband needs to look at it and he's not going to look at it for days yeah. but I can't but I just have to leave and it here. I don't here. want it to be far away out of sight tucked in put away because then he'll never look at yeah, it. Yeah and it can't go away because then he'll never right. look at it. Right. So the first thing I thought of when, when I'm listening to you talk about the newspapers is that sounds like a one in a one out kind of thing like you said I read it right away, but he doesn't read it until the next week when the next one comes. So if that's how it actually works, then there wouldn't be a pile because he would, there'd be one newspaper, but it sounds to me like there's a pile. So maybe he doesn't read them every week. He might not. Get he might one. not. No, there's always two. Because oh, there's, there's always two. There's the okay, two. Okay, two. Okay. Piles are different for everyone. Two, two papers might be a pile for someone and 20 might be a pile for someone else. So... When I hear you describe the place or the, um, the physical space, it sounds to me like the things don't have a home. I mean, they have a global home, which is the top of the buffet, the top of the counter, the top of the table. But they don't have a receptacle. So if you're touching the papers, is it possible to assign homes to them so that they get put in the home or the place and then task your husband with, when, when it gets full, and that's that's like a limiting container for an adult, because we all have them. Some of us have bins, some of us have mailboxes that when it's full, we have to address it because the mailman won't stick any more mail in there. Mm -hmm. Basically, we need to use our space to define what we can keep. So if you have containers and categories, everything has a place to go, and when that container is full, some action needs to happen, and it becomes much more dire consequences if the container is vomiting stuff versus a countertop. Because a countertop overflowing, you just toss one more thing on there. A container overflowing has a different visual impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would right. probably be my suggestion. And again, it's, it's back to that buckling down and being like, okay, we, we have to do this. Or we have to give each other a time frame. If, if this isn't dealt with in a week, I, I again, I'm picking time frames because I don't know the situation, but if this isn't dealt with in a week, that means I have permission to pitch it. Does that make sense? It's something you would agree on together, of course. Yeah. So, does that feel good? I have, an e I have a text question. Good. Uh, and so, the, she's asking about tips for moving and starting fresh in a new home. Ooh, that is always fun. Uh, anything specific or just tips for moving and starting fresh? Well, and this is this is my friend that was that was watching um, mm -hmm. remotely, and um, she's got a two year old, so I know that okay. that's, part of, that's part of the situation. But I'm uh, so I'm sure she's looking for general tips as well as uh, any if you have toddler tips. My suggestion for anyone who's moving into a home is to really 
think about the space and how it's going to function. A lot of like, like when I talked about my kitchen and how we just unpacked because we had to get unpacked and things went, the left side griddle went where it really didn't belong and it took me five years to figure that out. When we unpack our stuff, we usually are in a rush to put it all away and then it becomes part of the landscape and we don't really think about it. It really takes a paradigm shift in our minds to look at the space and go, you know what, this is not flowing. And sometimes there's just simple little tweaks we can make, like moving a garbage can from one side of the house or one side of the room to the other. And all of a sudden it's easier to throw stuff away and garbage doesn't get, it's little teeny shifts like that. If you're right-handed when you're setting up the kitchen, don't put the utensils on the left hand side, things like that. They're crazy, crazy simple, but we don't think about them. So it's really thinking about your new space, what fits in your new space, what's going to function for you long term. Like you don't want it to just work for your two-year-old two -year -old today. You want it to kind of grow with her and her family. So it's a lot to think about. And I'm a theory, I mean, I'm always for less is more. I think the less we have, the easier it is to maintain, the more time we have to spend with family, that kind of thing. And to start packing soon, don't, don't, don't wait till the week before because it'll be a nightmare. Okay, good deal. What if you can't get people to stop giving you? Presents? Oh, great question. She said, what if you can't get people to stop with the presents? What if they won't do, um, the, they're not going to, they won't be cooperative around the experiences or nope. the, um, that is a great question. That is a great question. So here's where we get to be um, the keeper of our own castle. Just because someone insists on giving Johnny a gift doesn't mean that that gift has to stay. And I, I, I choose my words lightly because I don't want to upset anyone and I'm not inferring that Johnny got this gift and now we're just going to throw it away kind of thing. But really being mindful of what we're bringing into our space. And if it's a gift that was given with love, that's great, we could acknowledge that, but it doesn't mean that we have to keep it. And I go through this with adults all the time who keep things because that was a gift from so-and-so. Yes, but you just told me you didn't like it, but so-and-so gave it to me. And I'm like, yes, and it was a gift, which means the recipient gets to choose what happens. It's very uncomfortable. It feels very uncomfortable initially to make those decisions. However, you live in your home. So whose needs are more important? The need that you have in your home to create something that resonates with you and brings you joy or the need to honor somebody else's need to give a gift because it fits their purposes. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. It's super uncomfortable. It's super uncomfortable initially, but after some time, it, you know, it can happen. It can work. Well, yeah, because now we're talking about more than just stuff with no emotional charge to it. Now that's that's we're talking well, about relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Which is why when I'm talking about the steps program, it's like don't start with everything Johnny got for his birthday. Start with the junk drawer. Start with the bathroom closet. Start with things that have no emotional attachment, and then work into the bigger things because. The bigger things are much harder to make decisions about. And if you have these little successes, of, oh, yeah, I did that junk drawer. No problem. I got this. Oh, yeah, we can get rid of that. You can build on it. And you'll feel more confident. And it'll become easier. I have clients tell me that they go through Target and pick things up and say, what would Tammy do? It's like, oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter what I would do. Does it fit in your space? Do you love it? Do you need it? Do you use it? And they'll run those questions through their mind and be like, yeah, it's pretty here on the shelf, but I don't really have a place for it. Back it goes, out they go, you know. I, one thing that I found helpful when my, um, both my, my parents passed and, you know, you get stuff. Yes. I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with the, um, the emotionality of getting rid of, of stuff right then. Yes. It, it, so I didn't. I just kind of packed it up and kept it. But then I went through it again a little later. There was another opportunity. And I found I could get, oh, suddenly the charge has dissipated around this particular thing. And I could move it along. This thing, I still needed to keep. And so I did. And then, and then we had to shift it an, another time. And then sure enough, on that, that time, 
when I touched this, these things, again, the charge had dissipated and I could move it along and it's gotten, it's gotten easier every time. You have to have somewhere to keep it. Yes. So it doesn't turn out like the letterman jacket on hand. Exactly. But you got to have some place to keep this stuff. So True. then there's and, there are limits of physical. Yeah. It's never a one and done. I mean, I'd love to say other than the straightening piece, I probably have to, to eliminate in my home probably every six weeks. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to pick a number here, but, but it's not a one and done. Even with the straightening method and doing that and tidying up, things are consistently coming into the homes. And we're not thinking about what we're bringing in because it's one item at a time or it's two items at a time. And then all of a sudden we have a whole kitchen counter full of, oh my gosh, I don't know what this stuff is and where did it come from? Yeah. It's a constant process of identifying and questioning. I think it comes down more than anything to that is questioning things as they come into the space. And if we can make a decision right there, like, you know, how many of us go to, Oh, like, I'm assuming if your kids are little, you do toddler stuff and, and they give away free whatever, can koozies or notepads or pens. And it's like, oh yeah, these are great, but will I really use them? And can I just leave it here if it's not something I need rather than just taking it? That's stemming the flow before it even hits the house. And that's going to put you five steps ahead too and lessen the need for the steps program more frequently, if that kind of makes sense. Well, and, I th and I think as more parents do that, I was at a health fair a while back and, and had uh, yes. come through and say, this is very thoughtful, but we're, n we're not taking things. And I, and I think as, as more and more people do that, the, we who can be the belchers of plastic crap out in, into the world um, are gonna ha be forced to stop and say, all right. No one wants it. No one wants it. What's what's something else that yes. we can give to them that's useful? Yes, an expendable item. I was at a event last week and I watched a mom, a very who's very into sustainable living and very much resourceful and respectful of Mother Earth, and her two boys. They must have been probably like. I'm going to say eight and 10, maybe a little bit older than that. And they were having a discussion around a plastic water bottle that was at the event for the taking. And the mom didn't say anything, but the two boys had a discussion about whether it was useful, where would they use it? How would it come into the, you know, and they did end up taking it, the bottle. But mm -hmm. as I'm listening to them talk through it, I'm like, dang, these kids have got it. They're going to use this item, not just take it because it was free. So. It's questioning everything. It's, yeah. it's anything else, Chris? Or Sarah that's online, you got it. Do you have any questions? Oh. I'm good. Thank you. Okay, marvelous. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that um it's yeah, we do. I'm gonna I'm, I am so wishing that I had had some of this information when my kids were little, but um, they're big and, but that's for tomorrow night. But we can still teach them. That's right. No, no, no. They're still model it. Yeah. Well, thank you ladies very much for coming out and thanks for everyone that was on the call and thank you Hartley for your time. Oh, Tammy, can she say kind of what, yeah, what's the big difference tomorrow night? Yeah, what's, they want to know what, is there a difference between tonight and tomorrow yeah. night? Hold on a sec. Tomorrow night, we're going to cover the same basic, the STEPS program, but we're also going to talk about uh, organizing the family calendar, including the school, after school activities, preparing for grad parties, you know, how to get ready for the junior and senior year, and then processing the influx of college or higher education information and applications. Kind of some more general uh, ways to organize that so it doesn't feel overwhelming as it's coming in. It's actually very similar to the way we process our kids' artwork in terms of the concept okay. and that we need to keep that organized too because it's it's time sensitive uh but quantity wise can feel very overwhelming is the um is the the calendar information going to be very similar to what was tonight or is there are there different i think it's going to be very similar with the exception of there are things that older children can do that toddler and elementary kids can't participate in 
So there'll be a little bit more about that perhaps. About how they can be responsible for them. Mm -hmm. Or engage or connected or however you want that piece to look. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, yep. That's just what we needed to know. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. No, it's. We're not there yet. No. <laughs> That's yeah. That's, and when you get there, you'll be able to watch this. Like, it'll, there you go. It'll you be in the clouds somewhere, and Hartley will be able to help you find it because she'll remember the conversation we had. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'll remember, but it'll. I mean, I'll remember it exists. <laughs> um, we can all refer to this again. So, yes, will you send my email? To her so yes. You, um, you don't have an email, but I'll send. Um, I've got a couple of emails uh, from here okay. that I'll I'll send to you because she's interested in the Perfect. flow charts and I would the. Love that. Can you send it to me? Yeah, I can. And actually, one of them is one of them is available on my website. I just can't remember. It's not the kids one, I don't think. It's okay. the original. But I'll send the kids one to you, and then you can disperse yes. however you'd like. Yes. Why don't you just do that, and then I've got everybody's email, and I'll. Sure. Just That's that. wonderful. Sounds good. Paper clutter flowchart. The flowchart. Yep. Yep. That's the one I'll send. Okay. And Great. then, uh, and I like that graphic. And that graphic, if you can. And the graphic. Okay. Okay. Got it. Marvelous. Okay. Woo woo. So much, Tammy. This this didn't go entirely as we had planned with the Facebook, but it it worked. Staying so, close. Staying close. So I'm 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 pleased and Good. I'm grateful for your time. And I will see you at five fifteen tomorrow afternoon. So Sounds good. if any of Thank you, you everybody friends with bigger kids. Thank you. Bye yeah. Thank Good night. Good night.